I first found this on a physics homework assignment. And the <coughs> answer was in the back of the book. Okay? But the answer was wrong, yeah. Okay. You've heard it before already. I, 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 I've mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Have you heard it, the globe one? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> so I want you to imagine a sphere, a sphere whose radius is the average radius of the size of the Earth. But I want you to, to give us a generalized sphere. It doesn't have mountains and oceans and so on, okay? But it does have a North Pole and a South Pole because it's, it's rotating, okay, and an equator. Because it's rotating, you can identify all of its equator points on its pole point. All right. So it's huge, but I want to ask you, how many places on the surface of this sphere could you start from, walk a mile south, then turn exactly 90 degrees left, walk a mile east, and then turn exactly 90 degrees left and walk a mile north, and end up back where you started? So the answer is going to be a number, because the question is how many places can you start from and do this? Yeah. Maybe it's zero. Maybe you can't do it anywhere. Maybe it's one. You can, maybe you can do only one place. Maybe it's 12. Maybe there's 12 special places. Whatever. That's what your task is to figure out what the answer is. How many places can you start from? Here, pick a random place. I go a mile south, whoops, straight south, straight east, and straight north. And I don't end up at the same spot. Okay, this spot here doesn't count. Are there any places that do? I mean... Place on the equator, south, east, north. Oh, not that place on the equator doesn't. How about this one? <laughs> nope, all the places on the equator don't count. Are there any places where you can do that? Mile. Two, you know, two 90 degree turns and every, every path is a mile. Oops. So yeah. Path is the same. So we're going to go south by unit of one. Mile, kilometer, doesn't matter. It's a unit of one. And then we're going to go east by a unit of one, and we're going to go north a unit of one. And we're going to go in that order, this one, then this one, then this one. And what, what does order matter? Because, well, well, we'll get there when... What, what ideas do you have? The North Pole. The North Pole. Great. So is your answer one? No. Uh, okay, so he's, he's identified North Pole as one answer. Right now, I see. And... And that's a great point because whatever my unit is, a step towards the South Pole is any step. <laughs> I can't go any direction from the North Pole but South. So I could have started this way, that way, that way. It's going towards the South Pole. Okay. So I'll draw it like this. But then once you've gone that unit distance, you could turn 90 degrees and then, and it's going to close back on itself because you started the North Pole. This is a condition of spherical geometry. Just thing we're trying to notice, okay? It's not that you're going to think, oh, I'm going to get confused up there or there's anything weird going on. It's, if you're on a spherical geometry, there's special points called the North and South Pole. The whole thing's rotating around these equator points. And one of the conditions of a geometry being balanced this way or being maintained in, under the rules of spherical geometry is that if you started a path from the top point and started going south, east, north, if you followed this order, of course, if you flipped it around, you could do it from the other side, right? But if you follow this order, then that path will close on itself, as long as all your units are the same. Right. Cool. And again, the goal is just to end up back at the same point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you have any other points? Yeah, I'm in the same order of operation, southeast, north. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to fix these rules. I'll let you use whatever unit you want for the one. It doesn't really matter, as long as it's less than a quarter of the radius of the Earth. <laughs> Circumference, I should say. Yeah. I thought I remembered this, and then I realized it was because I because I I watched a video where you had gone through this before, and, and I you forgot it already. It's interesting. I'm like, apparently the book is occasionally wrong because I know this because I did some finance homework yeah. back in the day, and the answer was wrong in the back of the book. Yeah, that, this is what the answer in the back of the book was. Just one. One. The North Pole. Is that, has it been proved? Well, can you? No, don't give me any. <laughs> <laughs> No. Oh, okay. Well, let me ask you this. Um, like I'm thinking the first instruction. Uh -huh. One mile. If you, if, is it all right if I talk about? Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to. Oh, you're supposed to. That's what we're waiting for. 
I guess like if you're at the South Pole, you can't go south. You can't go south. So That's the problem. Yeah. If that weren't the case, if we flipped it north, east, south, then you could have started from the South Pole, but not the north. So part yeah. of the rules is that you have to start. You have to go south first. At least one mile above the South Pole. Good call. Because otherwise, you kind of break the first one. Yeah, at least, but probably more, because if you started a mile. Yeah. A mile north of the South Pole, and Sorry. your first instruction is to go a mile south. Then you end up at the South Pole, and your next second instruction is to go a mile east. And you can't uh, do that either. You can't go east now. <laughs> yeah. So it has to be some more than that mile about. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So he's able to rule out that you can't start anywhere down a mile or whatever our unit is yeah. close to the South Pole. Yeah, I've eliminated a little bit. Okay. I've yeah. Eliminated. A small circle has been eliminated. Great. And. Yeah. And we've eliminated all the points near the equator, or on the equator, because we know all of them just go, yeah. so they're, they're a mile apart from where they started. So we've got another strip out of the way. Okay. <laughs> but is there anything different between something slightly close? I mean, what would something a, a line a slightly above do? It would just be slightly off. It would close a little bit more and more and more and more, more, more until you closed all the way. Right? So you could really eliminate anything that's not at that point as you go this way. But there's a confusion zone down here. <laughs> is, do you know the solution now? Has it come? I, I, I feel like I'm cheating because it's oh, okay. kind of coming back. Okay. Me, so. Um, so, it's on the right path. You're really on the right path. So, can I, <laughs> can I huh? Can I use your mark? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Or I can. Yeah, do so, it. Uh, <laughs> just think. Yeah, maybe it's infinitesimally small, but uh, yeah, let's say we have the equator. Mm -hmm. There's a little strip. So that, that part doesn't work. And then then this part doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I know that all these parts don't work. Except the top point, yep. Yep, top point works. And so, right now I'm leaning towards one answer, but this part right now for me is unknown. Yes, I'm, I just have to think about it. Remember why we were able to rule out the top half above the equator? Right. Because our path closes a little more the higher we go. And as, as we get to the point, that's when it actually closes all the way. Yeah. If you started a little bit south of the North Pole and tried that, then your, your path would have started... Like this, this, and that. It wouldn't have closed all the way. Right. Right? Yeah. So um, that's why we can rule all these out but that point, because you need to close the path up there. What happens down here, though? It opens more. Right? Or we get an inversion. Let's try this. I'm going to draw it like here. We're near the South Pole. Okay? We've got your line identified. That's, uh, um, um, oh, actually, I should draw it like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Near the South Pole, and you got your circle around it where that's a mile. I'm thinking now there might be a spot. Okay. Do you want to find it? Do you want me to go through it? The best thing so is you have to use the instructions to find the spot. That shape. Is that little bulged out triangle? No. Okay. It has to close its path. It has to end up at the same point. You can draw any shape you want if you end up at the same path. Oh, right. Yeah, that path. Well, here we only have three legs of the shape, though. So <laughs> it has to be a three-legged, three-sided three path that closes. So it will end up looking tri somewhat triangular, you know, in this two-dimensional. No. Only, only up shape. there. Yeah. That's the that's the trick of the puzzle. Only up here it looks like a three-sided triangle. Down here it looks like a three-sided. Actually, it looks like a. You start up somewhere more than two miles north. Okay. Such that, well, you come down south, and it's not two miles. It's it's more than a mile. But now you go down south and you're close. You're within a mile there. But what distance exactly? The distance whose circumference right. is exactly a mile and then you end up back where you started here and you travel back up the same path now you could have started 
here and done the same thing, or here, all the distance, radial distance, same points. So you have a whole line, an infinite number of points. Isn't that beautiful? And now, that whole line is an infinite number. So you've got one plus infinity. If you allow it to be an infinite number of points, I actually think it's discrete and finite. But in our regular way of doing geometry, it would be an infinite number of points and plus one. And then what about a little closer, say this point, which goes down to here, and it goes once, twice, back up. So now you've got all of these points. And you got another row and another row. They get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And closer. There's an infinite number of infinite collections of points in the symmetry that hold on spherical geometry. The answer is definitely not one. It's infinity. It's many infinities. Right. <clears throat> I, I remember when that first thing. It's like, the answer is one on the North Pole. And then it's like, then you went through and you were yeah. explaining. I was like, like I, want, I want to write it like this, if you know what I mean. The answer is one plus infinity to the infinity. <laughs> there's one, and there's an infinite number of points in this one, and an infinite number of those sequences. <laughs> Uh, that's a little, so maybe you're not supposed to write it like that, but that's a, you know what I mean. <laughs> that's so neat. It is, isn't it? Is really Here's neat. another neat thing. In physics right now, we believe we're in... Uh, well, why did you try to solve that problem? Why? I'm yeah. about to get there. I'm okay. about to get there. What we, what, we're, what we believe we're in right now is a, a Ramanian metric, a, um, a sphere that's double-sided somehow. You've heard of this before, right? The Riemann sphere? Yeah, imagine you got a, well, it's a, it's a manifold, it's self-balanced, so it's fitting inside of itself, but we don't have a picture for it, okay? So what we want is a picture for it. We want a picture for what the Riemann, Riemannian sphere looks like, even when you zoom in on it, right, at its internal boundaries and so on. Here, we have an interesting feature about spheres that we're noticing. One, there's a special point up top that's like an analog point here. We could change our unit to any size. Any size we want, and this special point will work. So we can use an X up here, meaning a continuous value to plug in, okay? And it'll work up at this point. But down here, we can't do that. We really can't do that down here, right? Do you see why? It's very discretized down here. There's not an infinite... Um, uh, or a continuous amount of values along this direction that work. It's very discrete. It's, this one works, and the very next one doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> For a while, and then all of a sudden it does, and then the very next one doesn't. Very discrete. Now, there's a connection between them. What's the connection? They're both on spheres. What if you needed to connect a sphere with a sphere, or better, more specifically, the boundary of a sphere with the boundary of a sphere? So you would have a Riemannian sphere. What if you needed to connect them? Well, what if you have moving paths? On one case, you have a, dis a continuous path. Imagine a rod between this point and the point down here on one of these paths. This one's really bound in a discrete revolution, a thing it has to do. And this one can match any continuous size scaling that matches the one down there. Right? Do you see where I'm going? We have a possible method from just spherical geometry alone by noticing the solution to this puzzle to connect continuous and discretation in a, a sphere bound to a sphere. <laughs> Maybe that was all new and a little too fast, but you kind of see where I'm leaning with this? We want a picture to end up with what it means to have a, a sphere who's bounded, all of its points are connected to a point of another sphere. Okay? Sphere? Two spheres bounded by each other. <clears throat> all, their, all their points are, are paired. Equally. And the connections, yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and, and here we have, just on spherical geometry itself, we have two types of ways to go about maintaining a geometric balance of a kind. Yeah. That's very specific geometric balance. There's two types of maintaining it on a sphere. One that only comes at one position, but has this huge advantage of being able to be applied to any scale you want. Yeah. That's cool. It's restricted in where it is. These aren't. These could be anywhere on there, anywhere on there, anywhere on there. They're not restricted the same way. This one's really restricted in position, but not in scale. It'll allow any scale up to the maximum scale of the geometry, okay, for that condition. Down here, the condition, once you pick a scale, then you've picked all the levels that are available to it, yeah. okay? So we've got a matching, but our matching is discrete to continuous matching. 
That's very interesting. <laughs> All right, those were our warm ups. What do you think so far? Head spinning or liking it? So uh, then you can come up with kind of like a characteristic number based on the length that you try, you know, instead of. Well, that's a good idea to carry that further and actually label each of the levels and get the yeah. relationships between the levels. Like the, the <laughs> would be fun, actually. Right? That, last, that, that circles at the bottom, mm -hmm. the, where you come back on your A lollipop path, yeah. The, lolly, the round part of the lollipop. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's kind of a characteristic length of the... Mm -hmm. yeah, the that circumference is always going to be the length we pick. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. it's this length or an integer. You know, yep. And then you have a very limited, discrete, smaller connection there. And how do how do they come together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let's go over symbols. Because as you're vitally aware of now, if you're trying to make sense of a puzzle, and you're really motivated to come up with the solution, it's not just for fun, but you're like, I'm going to do this until it's done. Like you've decided, the the best way to start is always first to make sure you've got all your parts labeled and clearly understood. All right, so I've got two little quirks that might seem weird at first. Let me get colors for this. I have a red N. Okay, and I have a blue B that I use. Do I have a black pen? That would be really nice. Yes, I do. Let's do that one. So I can keep those just that color. And this one's just the number five. And this one's just the number seven. Why am I? Why don't I write just five and seven? Because five and seven play very, very special roles in our geometry. Five represents the number of dimensions in the whole system. And we, demean, we mean dimensions in the literal physics and mathematics way, right? Dimensions are things that divide one. Dimensions are things that give measure. <laughs> okay, so. The number, the red N means five. Now, if I write N like this, like if we're doing a, a summation from N equals one to infinity, okay, that's not the same N. Just to be extra clear, I know that's baby talk, but that's, and we use N usually in this case to represent a whole number or K. If it's two part, we'll use K to mean the same thing as N, but a different one. <laughs> okay, so that's the first step. Pretty easy, but if you ever see me write an N or a B, if it's on the computer, it'll be in color and it shouldn't be confusing. But if you are confused about my N, did you mean red N? <laughs> just ask. Okay, because sometimes I'll just stick with the same marker I have. Anyway, next thing is we've got our rotations and I'm using this, this symbol, okay, to represent our rotation. And this is the subscript of the rotation, the number of it. And these are just in order, the smallest scaled one and the next one, then the next one and the next one. There's only four. These are commas in between them, okay? <laughs> okay, so just rotation zero through four. That's it. And this one belongs to time. This one belongs to space. You don't have to memorize this yet, just to let you see it. Time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. They're in that order. Okay. Next symbols are important is the symbol for the Gieskin constant. G sub gi okay and the Gieskin constant represents the Gieskin manifold which is the the minimal piece of our construction is the thing everything else is being built from okay the next would be the volume of the hyperbolic figure eight knot which is the equation between these two is that one is literally twice that one so if you know the number for this Gieskin constant then you know the number for the volume of the hyperbolic figure or not. Okay, they're connected, but I'm going to be using both symbols, so I want you to know them. I'm going to draw Cat Catalan's constant as a capital K. Online, it's both a capital K and a capital C, and it's not even consistent on Wolfram Alpha which one it is. Right now, I'm going with capital K. <laughs> that should be the only one that's kind of confusing. Um, but I think currently, when we get a new poster, it's all up to date as being Ks. Then we have the, the domino tiling constant and the dimmer constant. 
Have you ever heard of those before? No. Okay, great. It'd be all new. Then we have our jizz. You guys have already been part, partly introduced to the topic, so you know what I mean by jizz. But if someone's watching has no idea and just getting a notation down, these are going to literally be numbers that we calculate from one equation, 1 over x plus x plus x cubed over 2 pi. So right, this would be just the hyperbolic equation. We're making it hyperbolically closed, self-closed. And we set this structure, this algebraic connection, equal to just two internal rotations of pi over 2, um, offsetting some bound, in, inside some bound. And this bound is going to be the Planck mass. And it's not just randomly the Planck mass. The Planck mass represents the most external partition boundary of the whole set. So that's why it's the Planck mass, because everything rotates within the Planck mass. There's no partitioning happening outside that. It's just projection. It's not folding, wrapping, twisting. It's just being, because everything's thrown out from the inside. All right, so Joe 1, when we solve this equation, this is called the hyperbolic vortex equation, which defines the connection of the boundaries on the outside. Okay? Um, this one equation has solutions for our x. It has Joe 1, Joe 2, Je 3, and Je 4. And I know I've done this before, but it looks like this. Somewhere we're close to here, somewhere close to here, here, and here. Here's Je 1, Je 2, Je 3, and Je 4. And the reason I'm drawing them is to remind you we also have Je R and Je Theta as other representations of this same set. Start from 0, go up to Je 3. This is je r the radius yeah. and this angle is je theta so i can characterize these points using x and y parts i can the real and the imaginary parts of je 3 and je 4 i should say that too so i can break je 3 into its real part and its imaginary part yeah okay Right? You guys remember what real imaginary parts represent? It means x and y parts in this case. So its x coordinate is a negative number, and its y coordinate is a positive number, and the value would be the actual number. So when we write down je 3, I'm going to have to write it, and traditionally I write it uh, in its real part plus its imaginary part times i. So je 3 is a two part composite number written with both those things. Or, instead of talking about it in terms of its real and imaginary parts, I could just talk about uh, its radius and angle either. So you're either getting coordinate x and y representation or radial, radius and angle representation. Right? Normal, just like you grew up in, in calculus. Okay, that's our jeux. So far, good? Notation-wise? Okay. Now... E, Euler's number. What do you guys already know about E? What could you say about it? The exponential constant. Yes, exponential constant. I mean, why is it why is it the exponential constant? Because you could use two as an exponential base. You could use two to the x. That's still an exponential constant. But this is the natural logarithmic exponential constant, right? Or hyperbolic. So this is the hyperbolic exponential. Um, which means it's really the simplest of all exponentials. All right, what else? If I'm going to throw E up on the board, what are you going to expect to come in next? What's in the same mathematical class of importance as E? <laughs> Good. I. I. The golden ratio. The imaginary golden ratio. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to all these. Universal parabolic constant. The lemnus gate constant. The first lemnus gate constant, and the second lemnus gate constant, the ubiquitous constant. If you've never heard of any of these, the Gauss's constant, that's fine, and Weierstrass constant. You've heard of pi and i and e, I know, right? And the famous equation, e to the pi i equals negative 1, right? Okay, so there's a connection between all three of these. What about any of these? What is the golden ratio? Yeah, close to that, yes. It's what? 1 plus the square root of 5 
over 2. All right? That's one way of writing the golden ratio. Is there another way? Um, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You're thinking of making the, the shape itself. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. There's dozens of, yeah, right. of ways to write down the exact value. Yeah. Exact. It's not approximations. Dozens of ways of writing down an equation that get you that. One of the very, very interesting ones, I find them all interesting, honestly, because this is a very important number to us. Just like pi is important in the way it can connect and is very central. This one plays a very central role, very surprisingly central role. Here's one way to get at how, uh, how we know that. The gamma function, here's a symbol for the gamma function, okay? You guys have both heard of the gamma function? Are you comfortable with it? No. No, what do you, what, what do you know about it? What do you remember? Very important, it plays a lot of connections and things within math. Physics. It's the mathematical partition function, right? It's, we got a map of it back there, or a, a, yeah. a graph of it. I feel like I used it, you know, in a fluids class working with boundary layers, you may have. Yeah, you may have. It's extremely central in math. It hasn't been extremely connected to the central conversation of physics. I'm not saying physicists don't use it for anything, but it's not at the center of the conversation of physics. Okay, We're going to show that it is. <laughs> the gamma and the zeta function is literally at the center of the balance we're talking about. They're, and not just, oh, they're parts of or they generally qualify. They are the structure we're talking about. Here's one of the really interesting ones. Well, before I get to that, you know, I'll do it first. 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1. This is the, what we call the continued fraction form. But I didn't have to pick 1s. I could have picked, you know, 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 and keep going down like that, right? Now, continued fractions are a typesetter's nightmare. It's difficult to write them, right? So we have a new shorthand for writing that. This 1 is obviously the first one different than the rest because it's, not doesn't have any divisor parts, right? So we write down like this. This is one semicolon. Then we write the next number, one comma, next number, one comma, one. And it's just going to be like this. That's how we would write this number in shorthand. It's easier to see what's going on when you write it like this. So on a, on a whiteboard, we'll do it like this. <laughs> but you know, if you save yourself time, this is what we mean. It, well, these these both mean the same thing. All right. Why did I bring it up? Because it turns out that if you use this structure, if you use a continued fraction form and you pick the simplest one there is, meaning you only put ones in all of its coefficients down here, all the way down, then the form of the continued fraction itself equals the golden ratio. It's composed of an infinite number of ones only. Beautiful. It's composed of an infinite number of ones. Back a little bit more. The the infinite structure of the continued fraction form yeah. itself yeah. equals the golden ratio. The value, the, the decimal number you'll get spit out if you write down oh, one plus one over one, yeah. blah, 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 and you do it for a long, 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 long time. If you do it until you can get to 100 significant digits, those 100 significant digits will be the same <laughs> as that guy. Yeah. Really interesting, right? Well, look at this. The gamma function, which we really care about, I can say, well, give me the gamma of x, which is unspecified at any x, minus 1, and set it equal to the gamma of x plus 1. What, would, what, what does this mean, first of all, we're doing? We're, symmet we're taking the same function, and we're setting it equal to itself under inversion about what? 1. Under inversion about 1. Now, maybe there's no solutions. You plug, plug it in and ask the computer, solve for x. Are there any values that do solve this? And the solutions are x equals the golden ratio and negative 1 over the golden ratio. It's conjugate. Those are the two solutions. <laughs> really beautiful, isn't it? So the takeaway from this is that the golden ratio itself is built in to the balance of the gamma function. What does that imply? This continued fraction structure 
is one of the ways you could talk about what's going on with the gamma function. So we're after that story and clarity. So that made it to here. What about the imaginary? Oh, I should talk about I first. What do you guys know about I already? Okay, which means what? Seems anti-intuitive, but uh, somehow it actually seems to work. Because at least in our initial conceptualization, we're like, well, you can't put square root of a negative number, but then what if we could? Yeah, well, let's put, maybe this will speed things up. When we learn numbers, we learn the number line. I need a minute, but please continue. Yeah, do with that. Okay. And numbers themselves, from that point on, usually for most people, live this way. A number is a, as a, a thing in your head that orders things. It gives sequence. It defines sequence. One, two, three, four, and negative, and so on. And negative is totally fine, and positive is totally fine. We get with that. But if this is what numbers are, they code sequences, and you find out how to, Im to import the needing the sequence to make sense of the world. If that's all they are, then... When numbers are now representing two-dimensional stuff, you're only able to take a one-dimensional representation of a two-dimensional thing. So numbers actually weren't one-dimensional, but most of us, I'm not saying teachers mislead us by telling them, they just start teaching us numbers this way, and they kind of develop the impression, oh, that's what numbers are. <laughs> it's our priors. Yes. Like when, yes. Over when, when we want to have numbers that can reach up here, can describe all the points above and below too, right? And then we want to describe the connections between all those points. The numbers here have certain rules compared to numbers here and so on. There's, there's a whole system, a whole field or two-dimensional plane of connection rules built uh, naturally by numbers. Okay, so I is, is trying to tell us one certainly important thing. If you have I in a system, in the, in the equation, it's at minimum two-dimensional. That's what it's really telling you. You have a construction where, where one dimension of a kind is intersecting another one. And when you have one dimension and another dimension, no matter how you want to visualize them, they're unique in dimensions, that they're orthogonally intersecting, right? Because they're unique measures. Okay. So I will write maybe like negative one to the one half. And that's a way to symbol it. I'm totally fine with this way too. Okay. This is for I. But if I write it this way, then it's going to be easier if I change the square root to any other fraction. And we care about that right about now because the imaginary golden ratio, which is extremely central also, just as central as I, its symbol is the golden ratio symbol with the sub I. Okay, it just means the imaginary golden ratio and it is defined as negative one to the one third. What negative one to the one third? What does that mean geometrically? Before I was here, right? If it's a unit circle, it's a length one. This is length I, which is one in the other direction. Okay. What does it mean uh, to have this instead? If this is the square root of negative one and it's half rotation, a quarter rotation, sorry, half from the 180, then what does this one mean? 60 degrees? Yeah, like a third, third, and three thirds, right? So it'll take six times to go around to get back to one, right? So that means this to the sixth equals one. And I to the fourth equals one, right? And that means we have a, if we're using a system that has both I and the imaginary golden ratio in it, that means there's one way in which things are going around dividing up in quarters, and one way in which they're dividing up in sixths. Beautiful, right? Now notice the radial, the radius is exactly the same. So by that I mean the magnitude of I is one. That's the same as the magnitude of the golden ratio, imaginary golden ratio. They're on the same circle, they're just at a different angle, right? They're literally dividing up the same size of things that I is dividing up. It just divides it up in a different number of bits. <laughs> okay. So now we have E pi and I, we knew we're connected in a beautiful way. We have the golden ratio and the imaginary golden ratio, which has a really beautiful connection already to I. Now let's do PUP, the universal parabolic constant. The universal circular constant, its brother, is very familiar, pi. 
And the universal parabolic constant is pop. What do I mean? When we have our uh, hyperbolic structure, this cone on cone, if you want to slice the structure, take a plane and cut through the thing. Well, if you're taking a plane that's tilted uh, at this point and above, then you're only going to be slicing, say, the top or, if you're below the point, at the bottom. But if you tilt enough, you could be slicing both this one and this one, if you're going this way, right? There's, a, there's tilt cutoffs. So your plane could be intersecting in many kinds of ways. One way is to intersect this way, and you get what? A circle, if it's, if it's 90 degrees to the pole. But if I change like that, what happens to it? Ellipse. Ellipse. More and more elliptical. But it's circles and ellipses live here. Circles are if you're at 90 degrees, right? But ellipses are if you're like that. Just different angle. But in both cases, you're at top or bottom. You're not both. Okay? So circles and ellipses mean you're on one of the halves of the, of the boundary. You're interfacing with one of the halves. If you're interfacing with two of the halves, you get a plane that say goes this way and cuts through this one and that one, then its intersection might look like that, right? From the top half and the bottom. Oh man, I should draw it down here. Yeah. That and that. Yeah, right? Which are parabolas. Here's the cool thing about parabolas, just like circles. If you draw a little circle and you draw a bigger circle, they both have the same ratio from circumference to diameter. The same ratio describing them no matter what size it is. Same thing with parabolas. They're all exactly the same. There's a parabola, there's a point down here. You pick your your point, you draw a line straight to here, and you get down to here. This length divided by this length, so like circumference and diameter in circles, instead it's this length divided by that length. The same thing except the structure is uh, parabola is inverted from the circle, but they use the same structure of what we're trying to describe, and now that equals the universal parabolic constant. Just like circumference over diameter equals pi, this, we'll call it uh, f length, and we'll call this q, f over q equals pi. Okay? Always. If you zoom out, then this point goes up. But the ratio that you're getting is always the same. Okay, and this cool thing, circles and parabolas are the only two that have that. The only two that have a fixed constant of proportionality built into them no matter how you look at them. What scale they are, okay? Regardless of the narrowness of the parabola? Yeah, regardless, because right. it's still a parabola. So you have this universal circle of Mm-hmm. In order to be a parabola, you really need to be flat this way. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, no, but no matter how far you come out, where you're intersecting, it's still going to be the same. Yeah. Yep. You project your ellipse mm -hmm. into flat surface, and there's a... Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> also, every single one of these are defined in decimal form, and we have them. I'm being very vague right now, but not writing down all the numbers. Like I didn't write 3.14159 down for... But this guy, right? The same with all the rest. We will next, and when you want them, you need them. But right now, I just want to get, make sure we got the symbols on the same page. All right, universal parabolic constant, universal circular constant, gone or mentioned now. The lemnus gate constant, the first and second lemnus gate constant, uh, ubiquitous, Gauss's constant, and the Weierstrass constant. Oh. Lemnus gate constant. First of all, what's a lemnus gate? Do you guys know what a lemnus gate is? It's a, geometric, yeah, it's a geometric shape, and it's like this, the infinity sign. Okay, didn't draw it so well. The center should be in the middle. But, okay, the infinity sign, and it's got two different foci, but instead of like an ellipse that has two foci, it crosses in the middle. Let me draw it better. Let's say this is one, and this is negative one. And if we make it... Something like that. That's roughly what I meant. Yeah. Then now it's the unitary lemnus gate. Like when we when we say, okay, let's start with a unit circle with a radius of one. This would be the unitary lemnus gate where its foci are at one and negative one. Okay. When we talk about sine waves and cosine waves, 
right? Very, very familiar for us. Um, and if we make the, the maximum size here one, right, the standard sine wave and cone side wave we're used to talking about, um, what properties does, do these waves possess? Just like a circle possesses the property of pi, do natural cosine waves and sine waves possess any inherent properties we care about? Yes, they cite, well, it ends at 360 degrees and then it starts over, but let's just cut it off at, at one. Okay, we have one frequency and then it's all the same from then on and that thing has to me I can stare at it and look and obviously it has a property a wavelength it also has an arc length there's this length of this line yeah. is an actual length right yeah. if this is if this is one if we're talking about the unitary one then it has an actual length associated with one yeah. what's that value <laughs> we were never taught I was never taught I'd never heard of this before um, the the lemniscate gate constant is related to the length of this whole path, but that whole path's length is S. Okay, so this, starting from here all the way around both pedals, gives you a length called S. And S is defined as 1 over the square root of 2 pi. I try to have good handwriting for this. Times by... Gamma of uh, one half squared, all squared. All right. At this point, that should be just just a mystery if you've never seen it before. It's an equation that's connected to pi, square root of a circle, but also gamma of one half squared is the argument on the inside, but then the whole thing is squared. It's weird. It's complex looking, okay? But this gamma of one half squared squared shows up lots. <laughs> we'll get to a couple of them. The lemniscate gate right here, this one equals, so yeah, lemniscate gate equals s over 2. So it's the length of one pedal in the lemniscate, gate, in the unitary lemniscate. gate. This lemniscate gate constant is built into the structure of sines and cosines. Interesting. I don't know if that was ever pointed out to you before. I never learned that in a physics class. So the Weierstrass constant this is equal to 1 over the lemniscate gate constant 1 over the lemniscate gate constant times by e to the pi over 4 all to the 1 8. Okay. It's just another symbol and it has an answer that's a decimal number but the decimal number is equal to e to the pi over 4 to the 1 8th divided by our lemniscate gate constant. Look at this. i to the negative i is 2 times the lemniscate gate constant to the 4th times the Weierstrass constant to the 4th. Now, think of this in comparison to e to the pi i equals negative 1. As a geometric connection. It's not going to be crucial at this point because I'm going to have them all written down and given to you that you grasp the depth of each equation. What now I'm really trying to get you to accept or see is that these are just geometric parameters in our mainstream geometry right now and that they have connections between each other. All right, so if you could define the lemniscate gate constant then you can get to the S pretty easy. You can get to the Weierstrass constant. There's a lot of connections between them. Lemniscate gate L1 is equal to just L over 2. A lot of those in here, right? So that's pretty easy connection. The gamma function has two internal double periodic frequencies. And the equation for these frequencies, we call it omega 1 and omega 2. I didn't write that down on the list too. Omega 1 and omega 2 are these two internal frequencies of the gamma function. Omega 1 is gamma cubed of 1 third over 4 pi times the imaginary golden ratio. By the way, when I write gamma cubed that way, it's the same as writing gamma of 1 third cubed. I mean that. Just to be clear. I'm trying to be clear as I can. And then omega 2, omega 2, the other frequency happens to be 
Same thing, just without that. Okay, so this bad handwriting. There. Those are the internal periodic frequencies of the gamma function. Okay, obviously it's gamma related. But look what's going on. There's a one third division, there's a pi, or, or sorry, four pi, so a, a sphere that the whole thing's being divided about two different ways. And the difference is just this, okay, between the two. You said that gamma cubed was equal to gamma of one. Yeah, so, so you can write what I have here. It means, I mean this exactly as cubed. Yeah. Gauss's constant, the ubiquitous constant, are just like uh, the Weierstrass constant. They have definitions in terms of the gamma function. Um, I think we'll go over the board to look at them. It's going to be going through them. I'm just kind of giving you flavor of what's going on. We're covering the mainstream constants in geometry already. We have a few more. I'll just write them down so they look a little bit familiar. We've got the euler mascheroni constant. I know you've heard of that one before. It's every every geek loves this one for some reason at least, right? We have the di logarithmic zero or the the non-trivial zero of the logarithmic integral. So if you graph the logarithmic integral, it looks like this. So it just goes through point zero zero, and then like that. There's another zero in just the logarithmic integral graph. Another place where it crosses. And that's literally just the value, the x value of that, of that zero is this number. Okay? It's just built into the logarithmic integral as a fixed point of it. The other fixed point be zero, zero, but we already have the number zero in our heads. So, all right. Um, we have Rene's parking constant, also defined in terms of the gamma function. We have the CFP the fixed point of the hyperbolic cotangent. So if I write C-O-T-H of X equals X, there's only one solution, and it happens to be this guy. If you put that number in the hyperbolic cotangent, you get the same number out. It didn't do anything. So hyperbolic geometry itself, hyperbolic functions themselves have this special fixed point, and it's called, it's simple as this. Where did it get to? The Laplace limit. Alpha phygamum constant. You've probably seen that in terms of, or in reference to um, the Mandelbrot set, right? Yeah, that's, that's basically it. So this is basically the list of constants we need to care about. There's going to be... Uh, P3 also. This is the symbol for Polly's random walk constant in three dimensions. So with the ones we've talked about so far, we can now talk about the geometric connections and symmetries and rules that bind all of the constants in nature and the mass particles. So those are our data points. Those are our, the pattern we're trying to make sense of in physics is we've looked, we've come up with all kinds of very creative ways to look closer and better and closer and make a better equipment to make even a better measurement to say the electrons charge and so on, right? We've looked into the world and found 17 mass particles. When I say particles, we, we mean traditionally there's 17 values of mass fundamentally part of the structure of physics. They have measured accuracies. We have measurements that go along with these numbers, some of them more accurate than others. But the reason for why those measurements, why those values are the fundamental pieces of mass isn't part of our current story. The fact that they are the pieces is, <laughs> but we don't have a story for why yet, right? We also have 44 constants of nature. The speed of light, Planck's constant, gravitational constant, the electric constant, magnetic constant, the whole list of constants. Okay. Those constants, these geometric constants, they're all going to be referencing each other. And we're going to do that in slow detail, piece by piece. But I'm going to get you to get a feeling for where that, what that's going to mean. When you have a story that's tying together the puzzle pieces you have of reality, the things you're trying to make sense of and understand, what are they? Why do they have the properties they have? That's part of what are they, right? And what gives them intrinsically those properties? 
That's what we're really after. Isn't it? We don't want to know what properties do they have. We want to know why they have them. How do they get them? How do you use them? What does that interface with them? What does it mean? Right? And with the rest of the story. Let's go here. Let's say, remember we started our puzzle with a five piece puzzle earlier, right? And it can be really hard with just five pieces to figure out what it's supposed to be. What if you didn't know what the end shape was supposed to be? Oh my God, that makes it harder, right? Okay, we're in that situation here in this puzzle. We have really good, in some cases, measurements for these, these clues about reality. In some cases, not as good measurements, but still measurements. So all the measurements are the clues. If we end up with a story that makes sense of them, any story that makes sense of them, what does it mean we're in possession of? A geometric understanding yeah. for why they are. Yeah. yeah, right? So if you have a geometric understanding for why they are, you're going to have to interpret them in terms of pi and geometric things. The fundamental, most beautiful geometric parameters we've labeled in geometry aren't just flukes of thought that we've happened to come up with so far. They are noticing structure built in right. to the physical domain. I'm just going to give you this last overview when I start all over. I've got a systematic approach of way of looking in the world more concretely. Okay, but I have a method that can look. Before we didn't have a method. What do I mean? We have a number for the electron's charge. That number comes from somewhere. It comes from an actual measurement, right? Now, um, what does that mean? A lot of people intrinsically feel that the electron's charge, the string of digits that represent the electron's charge, is contentless. Why? Because it's in units of charge. Okay. And man made up the dimensions of the charge. All right. All right. That's what they think. And it's not insane to think that. Because the truth is, all of our units, at first, were just made up for practical reasons, not random reasons usually, but they were just made up, right? The foot, that's a measurement of length. It was made up, <laughs> right? It's not bad. It's good to have a system. It's good to have, pick a base. You can do a lot more once you've picked one. But in physics, we found out, after we made up a bunch of references, and we made up ways to measure length. Different bases for measuring length. We made a different bases for measuring time. Different bases for measuring charge. Different bases for measuring mass. MEVs, GEVs, kilograms, right? They're all different conversion ways that you can convert to each other, but they're all different bases. And when you get exposed to physics, you get exposed to this whole set of information of things. But and here's the speed of light: 2.9792458 meters per second. And you're thinking in your head, oh, but meters are random and seconds are random, so this number doesn't really mean anything. Right? <laughs> and that, that makes sense if you're still holding on to the original approach of how we made bases. At first, we did make up random units. But the meter we use now is not the meter we used to use. The one we use now is literally defined in coalition with the rest. All the bases eventually started all random, and then we found out there's rules between these. Hey, and if you change this base to this exact one, these rules become simple. And now when you add this set of rules, you have to change this base to this exact one, now all of them agree. And if you do that for all five bases, there's only one set of dimensions you can use now that make the equations all simple. I'm not saying you can't then say, oh, but I want to measure it in feet afterwards. Give me it in meters, and I'm going to convert it in feet. Sure, of course, you can do that, and your, mean, your number will still mean something because you know what base you're referencing it to. What I'm saying is that when you're talking about the relationships that are more than one dimensional, yeah. it's got length and time, or and charge, and mass. If it has all five, <laughs> if it has all five, the only system you can coherently and trivially dynamically model its or model its dynamics is in the uh, CGS system, the system where we, uh, time is in seconds, where the length is in meters, where charge is in coulombs, and um, mass is in kilograms, and temperature is in Kelvin. Okay, now that's an important, really important step to get. There are bases for our measurements of dimensions, all started out random. Most people still feel that's what they are, but the ones we're using now in physics aren't random. They are explicitly picked by the equations. <laughs> okay? And the reason that it is like that is an absolute mystery. Why? That's what we want to get an answer for. That's the, the, the equations we found in physics tell us the relationships built in. The story we want is why? <laughs> why is it like that? Denying it entirely like this is empty content is never going to get you there. So what I did, is, the method I did was, uh, 
or to streamline the story, when you have a string of digits for the constants of nature, and when you become aware that the dimensions, the CGS dimensions, the system of units that all reference each other for seconds, meters, coulombs, kilograms, and Kelvin, okay, you write down all the constants of nature and make sure that you're only using those bases. That's the normal way to write them anyway, but you might find some way that are listed in, like, instead of in kilograms or it's in, you know, some other unit. But if you put them in the base, basic bases and now they're all being compared number by number to each other somehow. There's, there's a systematic way that you're capturing all of this information. Now, you're still conceptually blind to the content of the string of digits at this point, right? But if you know that all of them reference the same five dimensions only, and all of them are in base 10 and scientific notation, you at least know you're systematically grouping them all in exactly the same way. Yeah. Okay, now making sense of that systematic set is all you have left. You need some way, some process or method to now say, well, what's the next question I can ask from these numbers and get something back? And that's the process I underwent for a long, long time. But this time I'm not going to talk about how long it took. I just want to talk about the fastest way at the end or the most recent way I've done it so that you guys can contest, oh, I think this was a mistake or we should do this part again or you'll know how to interface with it and do it yourself. That minimum you can repeat it all. That's a big step. So let's start with... Maybe its symbol is xenon. It's one of the 44 constants in nature. And at first, it's called the characteristic impedance. Okay, And it has a value, a measured value, of 3.76730. One, three, six, six, eight, and an error in the last six, eight digits of 57. So plus or minus 57 in these two digits, times by 10 to the two. So that means you just move the decimal over two, right? But we're writing them all in this same notation form. And the units, so the dimensions of this constant, meters squared, kilograms per second, coulomb squared. So every constant in nature is going to start out like this, in the sense that we have a symbol, we have a name, and we have a number that's taken from the measurement in these coherent system of unit dimensions. Okay. And our task is to come up with a way of making sense of the number. So right now, yes, this is the number. This is our true data point. But it doesn't mean anything valuable to us until we can turn it into something geometric or it can tell a story somehow. So we have to find a method for doing that. The pattern I found, or the, the method that allows us to do that, I call this the universal binomial factorization equation. Factorization. The equation is this, that we can break all of these things up. We can understand them in terms of balances. Balance is maintained by manifolds, which means you're going to have big sections. You're going to have asymmetric connections. You're going to have big sections interfitted with smaller pieces. Okay, But there's going to be a pattern to the big and smallness. So in every case, you're going to have some primary action, some geometric number that represents some, something you can say in geometry. So if it's one, then it's a one-to-one -one relationship. If it's two pi, it's a circular relationship, right? So on. So some geometric action times by the boundaries translated in terms of the Planck constant. So uh, primary boundaries. And then that's going to be the big piece. Okay, we're going to have a big and small piece always intersected together, um, balancing out each other out. One plus or minus some terminal action on a very fixed set, the set inside our structure that are uh, folding inside out on themselves over and over and over and over on that fixed set of boundaries. Okay, this is it. This is the whole decoder for a constant of nature, but it's the same decoder for every constant of nature and everything that's maintained under those balances. I'm saying we have a, a list of parameters in physics that no one's found a uh, pattern to yet. Literally, no one, right? No one's found any way to predict them, to connect them, or tell a story that makes sense of these constants. And I'm claiming that we have one simple way to decode 
One simple way we can decode them, and it applies to all of them. Follow me? The uh, structure of the zeta function and the gamma function itself <laughs> is the way that these big and little pieces fit together. Okay? The, the equation for the zeta function looks like this. Zeta of, say, x, or you can make it two-dimensional, okay, equals something. Do you guys remember anything about the zeta function? It's, no, do you remember anything? No, this is the one that's the, if I do zeta of 2, if I pick a number in here for x, that equals over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared and so on. But if I put zeta of 3, oops, that's a really bad zeta, but zeta of 3, then I would change it to 1 over 1 cubed plus 1 over 1, or 2 cubed plus 1 over 3 cubed to infinity. So these zetas are... Um, a summation of an infinite set of numbers, but the numbers are very simple. It's always a simple sequence of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to infinity, but the power that they're under differs for each number of zeta. Okay, and the Riemann zeta function, this function, is the centerpiece of the biggest question in mathematics. Why does the Riemann uh, function have all of its non-trivial zeros at one half, along the line of one half, right? So, the method. Now, how do we apply this? We have a number, we have our dimensions, we have five Planck constants, Planck time, the Planck length, the Planck uh, charge, the Planck mass, and the Planck temperature. All of these dimensions here are very easy to decide which one's which. Meters squared would be the Planck length squared. So we're gonna convert our, we start with our primary boundaries, that's the first thing we do. Um, we convert these just into Planck lengths, right? So meters, meters squared turns into LP squared. Kilograms turns into Planck mass. Then seconds, Planck time. Coulomb squared is charge squared. Okay, that's our first step. Really easy, actually, right? You take your constant, your measurement, your string of numbers, string of digits that you don't know what mean yet, to interpret them, we look at our dimensions of the number itself, because this number is a, a magnitude representation of something, and the something is these guys. <laughs> two of these, one of those, being divided up by one of these and two of these. That's literally what this number is representing. But since you don't have a mental picture for what that guy and this guy and this guy and this guy are, that doesn't mean much yet, right? Following? Confused? <laughs> okay, ask. Ask. Now down there for the because uh, before you had had uh, was it Planck length Planck mass divided by Planck charge squared. Now I'm seeing Planck length squared, Planck mass, Planck temperature, and then Planck charge squared. When was before? Maybe I've just been doing it wrong the whole time. Oh well, it depends on the constant. So oh, okay, okay, you're defining so, the yeah, in, in, okay, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. in for for this okay. constant we're going to apply it out of this, and the first step is to figure out as primary boundaries, which means gotcha. we have to look at its, its dimensions. So this is just for this constant, yes. Okay, no, I see, I thought you were, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Now, what, what's next? That means we figured, this is our BP right here. We've got it, we're done. So we're gonna put AP here, and we're gonna pretend that this piece, since it's the small piece, since this box symbol here represents the number one times 10 to the negative seven, at least for the first seven significant digits, it's just 1.000, okay, times 10 to the negative seven. This number at first isn't as important to us. Why? Because we, the fact that it has one times 10 to the negative seven means that whatever this number is, it doesn't come in until one, two, three, four, five, six, somewhere around here. Depend, and maybe it's a two digit number, so it'd be here, right? But if it's a 0.1 number, then it would be over here, and so on. So somewhere around here is where it comes in, which means if you ignore it entirely, and ask Wolfram Alpha, type in the number for Z naught, this whole number here with the power scale and everything, set equal to some X for that, solve for that. Pretend this part's not on here yet, and now know that your answer's not gonna be right all the way, it'll be right somewhere out to here. Okay, so go check the answer out to there, and see what Wolfram Alpha picks up or spits out as a geometric representation or a possible answer for the number you just gave it, okay? 
In this case, we're gonna, we ask it and AP ends up being exactly four pi. And when you get that, it's pretty easy to move on. So, oh, oh, okay, that's cool, let's, let's, let's ask the second part. But let's say in general, if you were asking to do it the first time, maybe four pi is an answer, but there's another one that's one significant digit less that's a good answer too. Write it down too. Okay, you're, you're filling out a list of all the things it could be. Because when you're starting out, you don't have any idea. All right, so this one beautifully turned into four pi. Now what do we do? Well, now we bring this piece back and we want to get the rest of the digits right. Well, great, now we can, since we know the piece, we know what the digits would be if it was just four pi. That gives us specific digits all the way out there. The difference in digits now allows us to calculate what this piece here is. So we're gonna write one plus one half the real part of the infinite power tower of i times j r squared. Now I want to pause here. He laughed. Why? Because how cool that is? <laughs> yes, but it might also be intimidating. Like, oof, I have no idea what that is. That's fine. Our procedure right now is to use this prescription to pull apart what geometric parameters could be making sense of these things. Okay? And it's not until you have the whole list of them that you're going to have a full answer that you believe in anyway. So if there's more than one, write them down. More, and also importantly, when you're searching, I guess I didn't mention this this time, the search space, when you ask this question, Wolfram Alpha knows all the numbers we wrote up on the board so far, except for the five rotations and the jizz. It knows all those other numbers built in, okay? I mean, <laughs> so when you're asking a question, you literally have to ask it, and then you have to pull out a je and ask it, and then pull out a je squared, or je one squared, and je one cubed, and je one to the fourth, and then invert the powers and try it again. Ask, pull the, all the possible jizz out at all the possible powers, and then you've asked the question, it's like a matrix of questions you've asked, but then you've got to spit out of possible answers. If there's only two, great, you've narrowed it down to two possible answers, study them both. <laughs> Look into them both. Try to spend a whole day looking at the first one and taking it as seriously as possible. Don't care about the other one yet. Try to take it as seriously as possible. And if you can make progress when doing that, then you keep going. If you don't, you hit a roadblock, go to the other one, take it seriously, right? This is the method. It doesn't mean you're gonna not hit a roadblock again. It means that you now have a prescription way to now start asking and looking. And even if it only narrowed it down to say 10 answers each time, well now you've got 44 sheets of paper that have 10 possible answers for how to geometrically interpret that constant nature. The hard work of the pattern is this. You have to pull out, I said it once already, but you, when you ask a question, you have to pull out um, Zhou 1 and do all of its powers and Zhou 2 and so on. It takes a while. Let me pause there for a second. At this point in time, it takes a while. One of our next projects is to automate this process. So we're gonna automate this process to have it do exactly what I just told you. Put in the number, it's going to ask the number out to 10 significant digits, and then nine, and then eight, and seven, and six, and five, and four. And then every answer it got, it'll spit out and categorize them. And then it'll measure them. How accurate are they compared to the measure? You know, I think I've now, in this last run through, done them all. But I'm a human, and I could have missed one, and I could have made a typo, and I could have a minus sign somewhere I forgot, right? I recently went through them all, asked every iteration of jizz, the real parts, the imaginary parts, to every power and inverse power. I pulled them out of every single constant nature and every single mass particle, and asked every question again. And all my left-hand sides stayed the same, and a bunch of the right-hand sides I had missed some imaginary and real questions I hadn't asked, and they got so simple. So I think it's really getting there, and it's telling us that it's only the gamma function and the zeta function that are fitting together externally. What do I mean by that? We have a, a four-dimensional external domain that's projective, which means it's balanced on some internal rotation, some action on itself. That internal action is the distortion, the volumetric distortion of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, but it's self-closed, self-symmetric, um, self-dual would be the word for it, right? So the volume inside that hyperbolic figure eight knot is completely cut off fluid-wise, domain-wise from the volume outside. If you find yourself a point inside the volume, you'll never get to be outside doing anything that the outside does. If you're outside, you'll never get to be the inside. You're separated, okay? It's a small little volume, the smallest possible self-closed volume according to geometers right now, and the external domain is its inverse, the largest possible 
constructibly bound volume, the n hypersphere of maximal volume. Okay, these are shapes in geometry already. And we're claiming, I'm claiming now from observing these numbers, that those two shapes are actually the two parts of the manifold, the inside and the outside, of the one minimal manifold structure that this whole geometric system is talking about. Okay. Zeta function. Minimum structure. So minimum balance structure too. So if you have a minimal volume complement that's persisting, then there's actions more than one, plural actions that are maintaining it. Okay, those actions continue to do whatever they're doing relative to each other, which means they build in a logic to the system. They have a this happens and this happens and these it builds a logical structure and maintains it. And that's where we get our well, yeah. I answered your question, right? Yeah. Okay. The zeta function of x, this don't specify yet, if I take zeta of x minus zeta of zero, what, what would this mean? Just It's a function. We, ha we got some x we haven't specified, but we can minus the function with its zero in it. What would it mean? We're just taking a difference, right? Between the value of the function at x, whatever that is, and the value of the function at zero. Follow me? So balance. Yeah, we're, we're just, we're asking in this question, well, once you give me an x, I can then tell you the variance between that position in the zeta function and the zero position in the zeta function, right? Yeah. All right, cool. What if then we want the zeta function itself to be fit against its own derivative functionally? Meaning, let's say we want this thing to be equal to Whatever scale we're going to pick, multiplied by the first derivative at zero. Kind of beautiful, but do you see what the, the symmetry I'm saying here? If we have an, uh, a function that's doing an action, and it has a derivative, it's like at 90 degrees at zero also, that's a different action there, but those are going to be fitted together perfectly, right? Now, we're going to pick some scale that we're interested in. At what scale, at what x is our question? So we're writing this question in Wolfram Alpha. At what x, what scale or position in the zeta function would the difference between that and zero make up for scaling the derivative at zero by the same? Like if you're in calculus, you're splitting up in a certain number of pieces, but you have to keep track of all the number of pieces, right? So we're breaking up a system like that, and we haven't defined the scale. We're asking, what scale does this work on? This structure in the zeta function itself, I just wanted to put out because there's a really cool clue about to come. It turns out that the solution for this is when x is equal to our exact external boundaries. Yeah, Planck length times by the Planck mass, which is one mole, and then you divide it by Planck charge squared. That's where the zeta function itself symmetrically closes all on its own without needing anything to be done. It breaks up exactly into x, right? It's balanced around at zero, but on the other side at 90 degrees, it has that many pieces with the derivative of zero fitting together. This is interesting. <laughs> this is really, really interesting. The zeta function itself codes the balance on the external four connections in our whole structure. It's very central. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, now we didn't go through an actual process and do one for you yet, so you shouldn't feel like you're an expert at doing that. This was supposed to be an intro overview, and then we can be more detailed and have you physically do it yourself until it makes sense. But at this point, I want to know how much of the procedure of how we ask each constant of nature, how we ask each string of digits what it means, made sense to you? Much more clear. Yeah. It's much more clear? Yeah. Okay but I want you to be empowered enough to know exactly how to do it when you want. Because when I'm all by myself all day, I literally have to think of a question. I sometimes I really come up, when I think of one, oh, I've never asked that. I get lit up. <gasps> I have a new question. Let me go ask. Even though I know it's going to take me two hours to answer it, that's fast now. It used to take me three days. I want to automate it. I want to be able to come up with a question and say, ask. And it'll build my, my sheet of possible answers and sort them based on their sigmas, right? 